Well, hey, good morning. How's everybody doing? My name is Travis Cook. I'm one of the pastors here. I've been a pastor here for about 10 years, a little more than 10 years, and I've attended the church even longer than that. And uh, I learned something uh, about myself this week. I knew about my family heritage. I knew we came back or we came from England, uh, but I didn't know what our family motto was, what's on the crest, what's on the Cook family crest. And it's this, and I think it's really cool. Yield not to misfortunes, but go the more boldly against them. Which I don't know why, but it sounds like a, a Star Trek theme. I, I don't know. But this was written long before Star Trek, and I didn't know this. I didn't know that this was the family motto. At some point in the, the transatlantic trip uh, that my ancestors took, this got lost uh, in, in, the, in the trip. Clifford Cook, my great-grandfather, didn't tell me about it. Charles Cook, my grandfather, didn't tell me about it. Larry Cook didn't tell me about it. I had to look this up on the internet where you learn about everything, right? And so at some point, this was really important to my family. So much so that this is what they put on the crest. This is what we want our family to be known by. Now, obviously, it's probably some uncle that was just like, I really like this. And they put it on the crest. Or maybe it was like a core value of the family. But at some point, what our family was about stopped getting handed down from generation to generation to generation. And by the time it got to Travis Cook in 1983, it was not being passed down. What do you want your family to be about? What do you want your household to be about? When people come into your home, whether you've got a family of 20 people living under one roof or it's just you, what do you want people to experience? What do you want the generations to talk about when they come under your roof what do you want people to know your home for? And what do you want to pass on to those generations after you? I think all of us want to have a wise and flourishing household. We want our households to be life-giving. We want our households to be things where life is given. And I use the word households because, yes, the title of the sermon is family. But we live in a day and age now where family can mean a lot of things. And so I'm going to use household a lot this morning. Because I want us to talk today about how we can cultivate a wise and flourishing household by looking at Proverbs chapter 23, verses 22 to 26. Last week we talked about God's guidance, just God's guidance in general. And today we're going to be talking about God's specific guidance for the household. And we're going to see three marks of wise households. And the first is this, wise households are devoted to truth. They're devoted to truth. Look at verse 22. Listen to your father who gave you life and do not despise your mother when she is old. Buy truth and do not sell it. Buy wisdom, instruction, and understanding. So the ancient Near East household was in many ways different than the households we have today. In our day and age, there's basically three different kinds of households that you'll come upon. One is the nuclear family. It's a parent or parents with some children. Another one is the non-platonic couple, the romantically involved couple. They're cohabitating, they're engaged, they're, they're something, they're, they're in a relationship together. And then the last is a person who lives alone. Whether they've never been married, or they're widowed, or they're divorced, or they live alone, or maybe they live with a roommate totally platonic relationship. But in the ancient Near East, there was really only one kind of household. It was a family kind of living together. You had a patriarch and a matriarch and around them developed a community. And the sons maybe moved out of the home when they got married, but they didn't go very far. They lived just down the road or maybe even, even a stone's throw away. If you had a daughter and she got married, she went to live with her son's family or with, the, with her husband's family. And that's how it worked. And so even though they're different, God's design though, just because it's different, God's design for the family, God's design for the household has never changed since its inception. God desires that the household be a place where you are taught 
how to follow, how to honor, and how to love him. That's God's design for the household, whether no matter how the household changes, no matter what happens, no matter how many people are living there, that is God's design and desire for the household. God desires flourishing in your home. God desires that you draw close to him in your home, no matter your age, no matter how different our houses are. And this is what Proverbs 23, 22 to 23 is actually telling us. And it's telling us in two ways. One, it's telling us that this is something that we do throughout our lives. Look at verse 23, or sorry, 22 again. Listen to your father who gave you life and do not despise your mother when she is old. Now it seems that the focus of the text is on the father and the mother, but that's not the case. It's a really creative way of talking about the lifespan of the child. Listen to your father who gave you life, your birth, and your mother when she is old. When do you take care of your parents? When you're an adult. And so this is the lifespan of the child. Your household is supposed to be this flourishing, God-honoring place at every single stage of your life, from birth until death. That's what the focus is. And he tells us how to do this. In 23, buy truth and do not sell it. Buy wisdom, instruction, and understanding. Buy up truth. That's what you're supposed to do in your home. Truth is described as wisdom, instruction, and understanding. A few weeks ago, we described wisdom as applied knowledge. One of our residents, Nathan Holden, preached in the chapel in the last hour, and it was phenomenal, might I say. And he said this, it may be better, rather than saying wisdom is applied knowledge, it's an applied relationship with Christ. And that just made my spine tingle just a little bit when he said it. I was a little jealous that I didn't come up with it myself. But you know, we're okay. My ego's not too bruised. Wisdom is there to navigate the gray areas that we meet in our life so that we can live our lives in such a way that honors God, loves other people, and makes the most out of our life. And the way you do this is to buy up truth. The way you do this is to absorb the truth of God into your life. In the Old Testament, this was the relationship that the Israelites had with God under the Old Covenant. In our day and age, it is our relationship with Jesus Christ, leaning on Him, trusting in Him, resting in Him when we fail, when our household isn't what it should be. This is what it means to buy up truth. It's grace, it's mercy, it's sacrificial love and service, it's confession and repentance when we fail to do the sacrificial love and service. So right here in these little two verses, we found what the home is supposed to be doing at every single stage of life, regardless of generation, regardless of time period. The home is a repository of truth. It is a bank of truth. Think about what a bank is for. It's a place where you can put money, right? You just keep your money and you keep it there safely. That's what the home is for, but with truth. Truth should be uh, uh, told in the home. Truth should be stored up in the home. I should be able to trust the people in my home to tell me the truth. But at the same time, I should also be able to draw on the truth that's stored there. Just like a bank, you go to make a withdrawal. If there's no truth being taught in the home, guess what? That check that you draw on truth bounces. And you learn about that when you get into difficult situations and difficult times. You'll find how much truth has been taught, how much truth has been shared in your household when you get to the time when you need to write a check from the bank of truth and it's not there. This is core to the idea of God's design for the household. And we know this because he says it in Deuteronomy 6, chapter 4. You can look there now if you want turning over. This is the Shema. This is the core of not just Israelite household teaching. It is the core of the way they understood their relationship with God. It says in verse 4, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. Remember, Jesus said that this is the most important 
commandment. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart, and you shall teach them diligently to your children. Now again, all this is kind of, kind of esoteric, it's kind of abstract, but then he tells us exactly where we're supposed to do this. Look at what it says. You shall talk of them when you sit in your house, and when you walk by the way. Well, where are you walking? You're walking to and from your house. And when you lie down, where do you lie down? In your house. And when you rise, where do you rise? In your house. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. There's a lot of debate as to what frontlets means. We don't really know what it means. But I do know this. You're describing somebody getting dressed for their day. That's when you would do this binding. Where do you get dressed? Hopefully, in your home. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. Where? In your home. God's plan is that your home is an epicenter for wisdom entering the mind and heart of your life and every single other person who comes in your home, whether they are there for five minutes, five years, or 500 years, it doesn't matter. That is the purpose of your household. Your home is supposed to be a seminary. That's what it's supposed to be. It is a place where God's word is taught. It's a place where truth is taught. It's a place where people are taught to rely not on their own strength, but relying on the strength of Jesus Christ crucified and trusting in him when they fail. That's what your home is supposed to be about. That's what my home is supposed to be about. So what does this look like? Travis, that sounds great. What does it look like? Well, one, it's a place where truth should be consumed. Your place, your house should be a place where the truth of God should be absorbed. Many of us design our homes around what looks good, right? What's aesthetically pleasing. Or you design your certain rooms around a certain piece in the room, right? Like the TV. All of our chairs are completely organized around the box that tells us everything we're supposed to know. What if you picked one room in your house? to be designed around the singular purpose of absorbing God's word. Now you might say, well, Travis, we're kind of packed to the gills. We don't really have a house free. I don't know what you live like. Well, I live in a house where I am also packed to the gills. But what if you set aside one part of a room? In one of our uh, rooms in our house, we have a chair. uh, It's appropriately named the squashy chair. I don't know where it came from, but that's what we call it. And it's just this big, comfy chair. And it's kind of understood in our home that if you're in that chair, you want to be alone. That's a little hard with a six and a three-year-old. But for the most part, that's a sacred space in our home where you go to do work or you go to spend time with the Lord. It's a place of peace. Do you have a squashy chair? Do you have a chair that everybody in the household knows they're spending time with the Lord and I'm not going to bother them? Now, you can't go there and hide. Sorry. Sorry. Just stay there all Saturday. Sorry, honey. Deal with the kids. Turn off the TV. Nothing wrong with TV. But sometimes we just have it on to have it on, right? Especially if you live alone. It's nice to have the TV on. It feels like there's somebody there. Maybe turn it off for a while. See what the Lord says, because he's there with you. Some of us are so gifted in making our homes feel a certain way. Imagine what you would do what you could do to make your home a place where truth is consumed. Where do you turn when you're hurt? Do you turn to the truth of God? Do you consume his truth or do you turn to other things? That'll tell you what your home is really organized around. Truth should be consumed. It should also be seen. It's not enough just to read God's word. People actually need to see it at work. They should see the truth that you're living out and be able to, we should be able to display it. Truth is not this thing that gets locked in a vault and hidden away. It is something that should be put on display in our homes. Your home should be a place of forgiveness, even unsought after forgiveness. It should be a place where truth is told. Lying isn't tolerated and not because of, oh, it's just not good to lie, but because truth and the truth of God is so highly valued that we will not breach that. 
Speak truth and grace to one another. Share with one another what God is doing in your life. Serve one another and proclaim why you're serving each other. Truth should be observed, but it should also be shared. Is your home a launching pad for the gospel? Look, we send you out from this church, from this building, about once, maybe twice a week. Your home sends you out into the world every single day. Do we use our homes as a sending missional organization? Are you raising your children? Are you encouraging your roommate? Are you encouraging your spouse? Are you encouraging the people that come in your home? Are you reminding them that, hey, when you step outside these walls, we are praying for you. We are looking forward to what God is going to do in you and through you. And we hope that people come to know Christ because of what happens in here and as people go from here. Is that what we're doing with our homes? Or are we just in such a rush to get out in the morning that we don't take time to think about what we're actually going into as we go along the way? Truth is an essential component of a wise household, but it's not the only component because truth without anything else can often come across as a bludgeon. It can be painful. So let's look at what else wise households are devoted to. They're devoted to rejoicing, to rejoicing. Look at verse 24. The father of the righteous will greatly rejoice. He who fathers a wise son will be glad in him. Let your father and mother be glad. Let her who bore you rejoice. Parents who see their children walking in wisdom, walking in righteousness, those parents have something to celebrate. It's such a great celebration. It's so exciting that in two verses, the author uses the word glad or rejoice four times. He wants to make it very clear that there is a connection between righteousness and rejoicing, and it's this. Righteous people have joy. Righteousness leads to to rejoicing. Now, righteousness in the Old Testament is a little different. We need to talk about this so that we're very clear. Our post-New Testament brains go to righteousness and we think of Christ's imputed righteousness that he gave to us on the cross. When you trust in him, his righteousness comes and takes the place of your righteousness. That's what we think about. And that's very true. But in the Old Testament, righteousness is a little bit more of a flex term. It can mean being declared right before God, of course. But usually the way righteousness works is it becomes this catch-all term for whatever the author of the book you're reading wants to like mean in line with his message. So in the book of Proverbs, righteousness is leading a wise life. That's what it means. So what he's saying here is that those who live a wise life often have joy. That's what it means. Now, if you asked people, Let's do a little man on the street quiz. We'll go down to Uptown or Deep Ellum and we'll just talk to people on the street. It was like, what do you think, like one word that would define a Christian household? Give us one word that you think a Christian household is like. What do you think they'd say? Judgmental? Difficult? Strict? Stiff? You might, might get somebody being like, probably nice, but probably keep their distance. I don't think anybody would say joyful. I don't think anybody would say joyful. I don't think anybody would say fun. Christians are not known for our love of laughter. Just sad. Nobody comes to the pastor's house and think to themselves, wow, pastor really partied us under the table tonight. So great. I know this because as a pastor, I'm usually running people out of my home by nine o'clock. So I want to go to bed. Rejoicing is a critical part of being in a wise household. Think about the marks of happy homes. What makes a happy home? They're stable. They're empathetic. They listen. They're encouraging. They're validating, right? They're righteous. They're exactly what the Proverbs describe. The unhappy home is the one that doesn't put the word of God into practice. Either because they don't know his word or they choose to ignore it if they do know it. Now, obviously, this is not across the board. I'm not naive. All Christian homes are not happy homes and all non-Christian homes are unhappy homes. That's not the case. 
I know lots of non-Christian homes that seemed very happy, even seem happier than mine. I would contend in those cases that those people, despite the fact that they don't know it, are probably living life according to the wisdom of Proverbs. They just don't realize it. And that's the thing. Wisdom, we talked about this the first week, wisdom often provides, especially biblical wisdom, often provides its own consequential blessings. If you do the Proverbs, you will live a life of blessing. And it's not because God is is necessarily pouring out extra blessing. It just kind of comes as a common grace. So we shouldn't be surprised when households tend to do right things, even if it's not God honoring, that they wind up being blessed. We shouldn't be surprised about that. So what are some things you can do to cultivate joy in your household? One, you can celebrate, and this is on the, uh, many of these are on the, the, ten, the list of 10 things that uh, Jeff, uh, Rodney referenced that Jeff has uh, as well for you online. Celebrate each other's wins. Celebrate each other's wins. Don't just celebrate the things that make you happy. Be pumped when somebody does something successfully. If your kid comes home from board game night and you don't care a lick about board game night, which first, what's wrong with you? But two, celebrate. Yay, you won the thing. With the, you got all the, the tokens. Congrat, yay. Maybe do it a little more convincing than that. <laughs> when they do well in their classes, even if it's not the classes you want them to do well in, celebrate them. When the parents in the home when the breadwinner and, and, and maybe the one that works at home, or maybe you're both breadwinners, do you celebrate each other? Do you say, hey, I really appreciate the sacrifices you put in. I know we pull equal weight, but again, I know how hard I work. I know you have to work just as hard. Let's go get ice cream. Celebrate when your friend buys a new home or gets an interview. Be the friend that remembers life moments. Guys, men, We are terrible at this. Great, you got an interview. Good deal. Stoked for you, man. Clap on the back and that's it. When somebody buys a house, make a big deal out of it. When they buy a condo or a townhome or whatever, when they move, bless them. Celebrate them. Don't be the friend that gets married and then leaves all your single friends in the dust. On the flip side of this, don't abuse, shame, control, or intimidate each other. The extent to which joy is allowed to blossom is directly related to the amount of fear and terror in your home. If everybody's walking on eggshells in your house, there's not going to be a lot of joy there. If you're going to cultivate joy in your home, make sure that your responses to unmet expectations are measured and appropriate. Don't be inconsistent there because everybody is going to fail to meet our expectations. Guess what? So are you. Play together. Play with your kids. Play with the stuff they like to do. Play with your grandkids. Be engaged with them. Play with your spouse. Don't just watch shows together. Actually engage. Play with your roommate. Some of the best conversations I ever had with my roommate in seminary was while playing Call of Duty on Xbox. The greatest spiritual conversations I've had were killing video game Nazis. I'm not kidding. It was awesome. Play with your roommate. Spend time with them. Make a game night party pack. You can go to Dollar Tree or Dollar Store and buy some cheap classic $1 games, some popcorn, some chips, some drinks and have an absolute blast on a Friday night with the people in your home for all around six bucks. And with gas prices what they are, that's a free tip. Celebrate rituals and traditions. Valentine's Day, guys, girls, it matters. I don't care for it personally, but my wife does, and so now I do too. Start some rituals in your home. Have a donut day or roommate hangout night. Celebrate. Have fun. Let's, re- let's take back joy. That's a, that's a thing that Christ gave us. Let's take it. It's ours. But Travis, you don't understand. You're sitting up there laughing and having a good time. We used to have a joyful household. And then something broke. Somebody left. 
Somebody stopped having fun. Somebody stopped pursuing righteousness. And it broke everything. There are all sorts of heartbreaking things that can happen to a household that's trying to pursue truth, trying to pursue righteousness, and trying to rejoice. Maybe you raised a child and that child is not following the Lord. Maybe you have a spouse and not wanting to play with them is not even a conversation. You don't even know if you want to live with them or it's vice versa. Maybe they don't want to live with you. Or maybe you want to stop having roommate hangout night because you want a spouse. You want children. If even one person chooses to not follow the way of righteousness, it can really wreck an entire household. Abuse, loneliness, addiction, irritability, selfishness, people not pulling their weight, all of these can diminish the joy that we experience in a household. And I want to talk about how we can address that, like actually practically address that. But I want to talk about one thing first, and it's this. So often, we cast the blame for the damage in our home on other people rather than recognizing that we are just as capable, if not just as culpable, for the damage done in our home. Every single one of us have failed to be the perfect parent, the perfect spouse, the perfect roommate, the perfect child, the perfect tenant, whatever. We have failed to cultivate truth and joy in our own households, every single one of us. You could label every single one of us as a home wrecker. We have wrecked the home. None of us have been perfect. And what happens is, we, we, we don't really understand the damage we've done because we so much want to blame other people. In the story of the prodigal son, it's a story about a home being wrecked. The young son t- says to his dad, Dad, I want my inheritance. I want to leave. And he goes and he does whatever he wants, destroying the home and the happiness of the home. Every single day for weeks, months, years, the father's on the house on the porch watching for his son to come home. The older brother is picking up the slack and jealous and that enmity grows every single day. Until finally that son comes home and the father embraces him and loves him and welcomes his back and the older brother is irate that such forgiveness should happen. Tim Keller points out that in that story, It's the third of three stories about losing something and something being found. And the third story is the only story where somebody doesn't go looking for what's lost. Because it was the older brother's job. He was supposed to go find the homewrecker. Jesus Christ comes to earth in search of every single one of us who have wrecked not only our own homes, but the home of God himself. And he wants to bring us back. And that's why he dies. That's why he suffers. That's why he pays the penalty that he didn't have to pay. He didn't wreck the house. He's the good son. He's the one that listens and obeys. But he's the one that comes for us. And he's the one who dies. And if you want to come home, the only way to find your way back is through Jesus Christ. The only way that you get back home, the only way you can find joy, the only truth that you need today is that Jesus Christ is yours. And he can be yours if you trust him. Instead of trying to find your own way back. Do you need to do that today? In a room this size, I guarantee you there's at least one. If not more. You've been gone a long time. Come home. And it is only when you have come home to Christ that you can begin to address the brokenness that's in your own home and in your own household. And let's talk about how to do that because wise households are devoted to one another. Verse 26, my son, give me your heart and let your eyes observe my ways. This is the beginning of a longer section where the father is talking about his son and talking about the parts of his body. And he knows that if his heart is geared towards wisdom, then guess what? The rest of his body will go likewise. The father here is asking for the most prized core possession that the son possesses, and it is the heart. Basically, you know what the father's asking for? He's saying, son, trust me. Trust me and trust my words. Trust me and trust my words. And when you live in a home that's built on truth and that celebrates with one another, trust is easy to give. 
Or maybe trust is necessary for those two things to take place. There's a symbiotic relationship going on between those things. But what happens when trust is broken? What happens when trust is the first casualty in a long list of broken promises and a failure to maintain the commitments that have been made? What do you do then? Well, first, yes, you're right. Trust is the first casualty. But you know what is always the last? Grace. Grace is the last casualty. Grace is resilient. It's powerful. It's beautiful. And the more it clings to our families, the more whole and wholesome our households will be. Remember, we are all homewreckers. And it is only to the extent that you understand that and believe it wholeheartedly that you will be able to extend grace to other people. Because as long as you treat other people as if you are morally superior, you're the good one, you're the one who does what they're supposed to do, you're the good roommate, you're the one that's always picking up, you're the one always cleaning up, you're the one picking up the kids from school. As long as you take the moral high ground every time, you will never ever experience a household that is supposed to be built around truth and joy because the other person will always know that you're judging them. But the more you let grace work its way into your life, the more you let grace settle in, guess what? You become someone that God can use to change your household. So what does this look like? Well, one, it means you speak respectfully even when you're being spoken to disrespectfully. Remember how Jesus acted when he was being accused? Always respectfully. Take responsibility. 95% of every single conflict is probably a two-party conflict. Own your part. You're not sinless. Own your part. It's never too late. That's another thing to hold on to. We are so stinking quick to give up on people at the first sign of failure. And maybe that's one of the reasons why they continue to disappoint us, because they know that we think they're just going to fail us anyway. Look, God's grace, God is is the, the absolute king of the last second grace turnaround. Don't give up on people. What would you do if Jesus gave up on you? Don't give up on people. Keep reaching out to them. Keep loving them. Keep praying for them. When they hurt you, take that to the Lord, pick yourself up, and dust yourself off and go back and love them again. Now, this does not include abuse. In an abusive situation, you should find separation. You should seek help and counseling. That's not what I'm talking about here. I'm talking about the day-to-day life of living in a household with sinful people. We tend to bang up against one another and hurt each other. Thirdly, remember this. You may not be able to rescue the person that your heart is designed for, that you want to rescue. I get that. But there could be other people. You could be the answer to someone else's prayer. Reach out to them. Seek out people who are alone. Seek out people who are by themselves. Boomers. Empty nesters, reach out to young adults who might be here without family. Single adults, young adults, don't wait on that invitation. You've got an apartment. Invite people to your house, no matter how old they are. You can go to Eatsy's, pick up something to heat up. It's fine. Not all of us can cook. I never could. I'm a cooking name only. This is my last name. You'll get it. You're all right. We need the strength of this church. The potential of this church lies in one thing, not just in Christ, but in practical terms. The strength, the potential of this church rests in the fact that we are an intergenerational church. And the extent to which we tap in on that will be the extent to which, I, I think, personally, the length to which God can take us. It is our greatest strength, our greatest potential. Grandmothers, grandfathers, don't give up on your grandkids. Keep praying for them. Keep loving them. Moms, dads, Keep going. Kids, keep loving your parents well. Keep praying for them. You might be the only person in your home that's a believer. Keep praying and trusting and keep proclaiming because everybody's household should be built on truth and rejoicing and we should be doggedly committed to one another. Let's pray. Gracious God and Heavenly Father, thank you for a home. Thank you that I grew up in a home that taught me to love the Lord. Thank you that many here in this room have. Thank you that you have brought people from all over, no matter what kind of background they came from, to be adopted into the kingdom of God. Lord, I pray that an adoption would take place today. 
that somebody would come to trust you for the first time today. And they'd leave the orphanage of, of lostness for the home and the palace of the king. Lord, lead us to have the households you desire us to have. That's in your name we pray. Amen.